Paganism is. Paganism is your home. Okay. Um, oh, shoot. Did we just go live now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're apparently live as of 11 seconds ago. So let's let's go back over our, our backgrounds here for a second. This is Chris Robertson and Augustus Invictus. We're here to talk about religion. Let me double check to make Paganism sure this is days. actually going here. Um, yes, we appear to be oh, live. Shoot, we just for real this time. Yeah, I just got an email saying we're live, so I reckon it's for real this time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I hate to make you explain your background again, but um, I'm – on the Christian side and you're on the pagan side, but not just a pagan. You have a, a rather interesting uh, religious background. Would you mind re-explaining that real quick? <laughs> sure. Well, you know the thing about politicians, they love talking about themselves. So it's no problem <laughs> at all. <laughs> never um, never yeah, shut the I'm opportunity a, to repeat. I'm a Thelemite, which uh, the religion is called Thelema. It is a sect of paganism. The way I generally explain it to people is, you know, Catholicism is Christianity. Uh, Baptist, that's a Christian sect, uh, Methodist, Presbyterian, those are all sects of the larger religion, which is Christianity. Same with Thelema, or Wicca, or heathenism, those are all different sects of paganism, which is the general religion. Um, I was not raised pagan, I was a pagan convert at about 13. Uh, I was raised as a Baptist in my family because my father was Catholic, and my mother was Jehovah's Witness, and so their compromise between those two totally opposing sects of Christianity was the Baptist Church. So that's where I grew up. That's where I went to Sunday school and mass and youth group and uh, summer camp and all the rest um, until I was 13, and I actually sat down and read the Bible for myself, and I noticed all the contradictions in the Bible. And as a Baptist, or as Protestants generally, um, you're taught that the Bible is infallible. It's the literal word of God. So when you see in black and white, there are discrepancies between numbers, between stories, uh, between chronologies, between even the genealogies of Jesus in the Gospels. Um, you start realizing that the Bible is not infallible. Um, so, you know, I spent a long time really anti-Christian. It, it took a while before I realized that it wasn't Christianity that I was opposed to. It was Protestant literalism. Uh, I don't have any problem with Catholicism. I'm actually sitting outside the cathedral right now uh, waiting for Holy Mass, uh, Holy Saturday Mass to begin. Um, so that's where I uh, turned against Christianity was when I was 13, and I started studying a lot of religions. And um, it was when I read The Occult, A History by Colin Wilson, uh, that's when I was introduced to Aleister Crowley and Thelema. Now, there's a whole chapter in that book about him. Um, I didn't call myself a Thelemite until I was about 16, but I was certainly a pagan from the age of 13 on. I joined the OTO, the Ordo Temple Orientis, when I was 19, the AA when I was 21, uh, and I was a member of the OTO until my expulsion when I was about 30, I think. Um, and so... To this day, I'm a Thelemite. Uh, I've also been initiated in the Catholic Church, though I don't consider myself a Catholic, uh, but I am 100% pagan. And I typically describe myself as pagan, not a Thelemite, because no one ever understands what Thelema actually is. So that's my religious history in a nutshell. And if, if you were to say, um, in the same way that you could say Catholicism is the core, and that is you could summarize in the uh, Nicene Creed, what would be the core of paganism? Oh, there is no core of paganism, and that's the beauty of it. See, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, they have their religious texts, and those are the holy scriptures, and you do not deviate from them. Or you have a core uh, body of work in the very least, you know, whether it's the rabbinic texts and the Torah and the Midrash, uh, you know, there are central texts to a religion. Paganism is not that way. Um, paganism is very pluralistic. It is not centralized. Um, well, I mean, you could argue that Judaism is not centralized either, but, uh, you know, there is an effort at centralization and dogmatism. In paganism, that's not the case at all. It's actually very organic. Um, your gods are family gods. Your gods are tribal gods. Your gods are gods of the nation 
or the empire to which you belong. Um, they are not universalized as they are in the Abrahamic religions. So that's actually one of the huge differences between Christianity and paganism. Interesting. Um, it's funny. I was uh, actually just listening to Greg Johnson, uh, another person who, who volunteered to have this conversation, and he is – uh, f far above me in, in, in skill and knowledge on these things. But they were talking about the film Silence and how they were, um, the Portuguese were attempting to spread Catholicism to India. And the Brahmins and the, the next caste beneath them said, you know, we like your Jesus, but we, we don't <laughs> like the idea of giving up our caste system. And this got relayed to the Pope at the time. And he said, well, okay, let them be Catholic and they can keep their caste system. And there are, to this day, as I understand it, Roman Catholic churches in India that respect the, the old caste system, and there are certain ceremonies that only the Brahmins and the, the higher castes are allowed to perform. So That is interesting. But yeah, that's actually really typical of pagan culture because mm -hmm. it manifests in different localities in different ways. Uh, the same thing can actually be said of Christianity as it is based upon paganism because you think about i mean easter's tomorrow and easter comes from ostara it comes from astarte the goddess of fertility so you think of uh, bunny rabbits and springtime and all the rest um, that's a pagan tradition that the uh, catholic church co-opted uh, same thing with christmas uh, most of the holy days um, and most people don't know this but easter actually comes from uh, it's a cycle I mean, every year it comes after the first full moon after the spring equinox so it's all based on the pagan calendar. It's all based on pagan traditions. Um, so really, the manifestation of paganism continues to this day, but it's always different in different localities. Well, and, and coming from a Christian perspective, that is very um, anti-globalist, and, and I am not a fan of universalism in any ways. Th there are things that are universally true about human beings, you know, besides the fact that we all have two legs and two arms. We have things in common, but we're different as well. And I think the fact that, that Christianity has been able to accommodate a, and adapt to so many other cultures, in addition to um, adapting those cultures themselves to, to their own beliefs, um, you know, people will say that like a point against Catholicism. And to the, to the rigid literalists, it absolutely is, because it does break down the, the universality of the truth that they think it holds. But from, from my own sort of, um, uh, I don't want to say multicultural, but I, I like the diversity that exists around the world. Uh, from that perspective, it seems like a point in, the f in favor of the church, the, that South American Catholicism is different from Italian Catholicism, <coughs> which is different from Indian and Japanese and African Catholicism. Right. And I think that that's a virtue of the church. Um, my major qualm with the church, besides what I was talking about, you know, revelation um, and, the, you know, the Christian God does not speak to me. Um, Jesus and Virgin Mary, they don't appear to me in dreams. The pagan gods, they do speak to me. Um, but outside of that, you know, uh, my major thing with the church is that it's mutually exclusive. Um, if you are Hindu, you know that Krishna is divine but so is christ and so is dionysus so is zeus um you know all the gods are divine they are all manifestations of the one god christianity is not that way christianity says that the christ is the way the truth the life and anything outside of that is heresy idolatry blasphemy um so that's why we don't get along that's why i could never you know subscribe to the tenets of christianity because it is so exclusive well it's it's interesting one of the the sects of christianity that i've been exploring personally um i don't consider myself to be an orthodox christian i'm way too new to the belief system to to claim that but they arguably existed prior to the catholic church i, I think everyone even the catholics acknowledged that they were essentially one and the same up until the, the schism that happened mostly after the Fourth Crusade. That was when the Orthodox said, eh, you burn Constanti Constantinople, we're not friends anymore. Um, <laughs> but the, the 
the orthodox view is that um, as, a, as a general rule, not believing the correct things doesn't make you a heretic. So long as we're still talking, we can be friends. We can have different opinions and we can you know, work towards what we think is true. The only people who got called heretics by the Orthodox Church, and they're one of the few who will still say, that's heresy, this is blasphemy, blah, blah, blah. Catholics seem very hesitant to do that these days. Um, are the people who voluntarily walked away from the church, who said, we're not talking to you anymore. That was heresy in their view, not just having the wrong view. Now, there were some exceptions to that, I'm sure. If you tried to defend you know, something like pedophilia, they might be like, no, you, that's, that's one bridge too far. But on the whole, they actually were, were fairly tolerant un, until you left them. Right. Um, well, I'm not actually too familiar with the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, my background's more in Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, specifically in America. Um, and from my experience, if you're talking to Protestants and you were a pagan, you might as well be worshiping Lucifer, you know, in the dark with witches at night. It's just well, that's totally foreign. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I get called a Satanist and a devil worshiper basically daily and it's just people don't understand the difference they don't understand what paganism is um, but there is you know the explanation that uh, the god of the wilderness whether it's pan or kernunos uh, the horned god of the wilderness um, that became satan because these uh, pagan sects they would still worship the old gods uh, and the features uh, the goat-like features they became part of the Christian representation of Satan, uh, because it was paganism itself. So really, paganism right. and devil worship became conflated because of Christian fear. Well, the, the reason that I brought up um, this this orthodox uh, doctrine, I, I shouldn't say that, this orthodox tendency to not reject people unless they walk away from the church was that the the commandment the first commandment of the 10 of the decalogue is not thou shalt have no other gods but thou shalt have no other gods before me and right in uh, i'm sure many other people missed it but we were starting to go into the nature of what a god is in our previous conversation and how if you're wim hof the cold can be god if you are a banker money or or social power or prestige can be a god, something, uh, some ideal or quality worthy of your attention, a wor worship deriving from worthship, the, the quality of being worthy of your attention and aspirations. And, and so the idea of not having any gods before God means that you're not attaching yourself to um, – to you know sun gods which i mean depending on your interpretation perhaps jesus is a sun god but um or to to mars or Ares or odin or the these other things to the exclusion of um the god of the bible which is tricky because the god of the bible is sort of hard to wrap your your head around he is not anything in particular but he's has something to do with everything at the same time um and it's a practically it's a marvelous stand-in for um people who can become ideologically possessed it makes it very difficult for you to become enslaved to particular ideologies um in the way that many other people have in the past well yeah i mean if you are actually taking it as it is as a transcendent god mm -hmm. um, in which case you know absolute moral dictums would not come from such a transcendent God who is above everything. Um, but two things about your uh, statements there about uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, on the one hand, that's really reflective of Old Testament culture, because, and which is where the Decalogue is from, of course, um, because the Jews understood that there were other gods. Uh, the God of the Bible is the God of Israel. He is not everybody's God. 
and they would have shuddered at the fact that people would think the Jewish God belongs to everybody now. That's why the Jews call themselves the chosen people, because God is the God of Israel, the God of the tribe of Israel. Um, so gods were real back then, you know, Baal and uh, all the gods, Ilila, they were all real to the Jews. God was just, you know, Yahweh was their God and he was the God of gods. Um, there's actually a part, if you read the New Jerusalem translation of the Bible, um, it talks about the part where Samson is tearing down the temple. And it says the people saw Dagon. Dagon was the fish god of those people. And it says in black and white, it's like, look, these people saw their God. He appeared and Samson tore down this temple. Uh, so the gods were literally real to them. And their God was simply first. He was the man. And that's why you worshipped him. Well, I, I agree with that. And I, I think the gods are, are no less real today. I mean, uh, when Wim Hof says, to me, cold is God, um, cold mm -hmm. is a very, a very real uh, thing it's hard. it's one of those things that you know Jordan Peterson would say you can't deny pain you can't de deny the reality of pain that you can pretend to but your actions will betray it and um, the the all of the gods are representative of concepts and ideals in in some way and the the question becomes what is the nature of the Christian God and for the Jews, it was a it was a tribal, a, a national entity, um, right? And with Jesus, I don't think he was spreading the the Jewish God in particular, but more the concept of of the Jewish God, but no longer specific to Jews because that concept was open to anyone. Anyone can have this tribal God that is their own, based on their community. Yeah. And you can see that in certain parables, like of the Good Samaritan, for instance. Exactly. Um, you also see it when the Christ spoke with the woman at the well, who was a Samaritan. And she says, look, I'm a woman, first of all, you shouldn't be talking to me. And second of all, I'm a Samaritan, so what do you want with me? And he just did not care about those things. Um, but that also reflects this, um, you know, this, this evolution of the concept of God throughout um, Jewish history. Um, because it began as the tribal God, and it uh, evolved into the transcendent God that we see in Isaiah. And really, the New Testament is based largely on that. And many of the prophecies of the New Testament, uh, well, that say they were fulfilled in the New Testament, they come from Isaiah. Um, so there's a hearkening back to that, and certainly I'd agree with you. That's probably what Jesus was talking about, not this tribal concept of a Jewish God, but the transcendent God that had become the understanding of the Jewish community at the time Jesus came. Yes. I, I think there actually is a tribalism left in it, though, or left open to people, because I, I think you and I are both on the same page uh, against universalism, against what Jack Donovan calls hugging the world. You know? <laughs> um, and the, the whole parable of the Good Samaritan opens with a lawyer saying, you know, how do I get to heaven, Jesus? Well, what does the law say? Love my neighbor as myself, love God. Jesus says, yes, do this and you'll live. The guy says, well, but who is my neighbor? You know, he's trying to be very clever and catch Jesus in a, a, a tricky situation. And, you know, Jesus gives him an answer. He says, you know, consider a beaten man on the side of the road. These three people come, the Levite, the priest, and the Samaritan. But people get it mixed up. They They – imagine that Jesus is telling the story from the perspective of the Good Samaritan. He's not. He's telling the story from the perspective of the beaten man and saying, now which of these three was a neighbor whom you are to love as yourself? Well, it's only, right. it's only one of those three. And the other two, <laughs> it was, you know, he was constantly pricking and prodding at the priests. Uh, it's like those two are, by inference, not your neighbor. So it doesn't include everyone. And you, you brought up the, the woman at the well. Uh, Jesus was all over women at wells in his day. Um, <laughs> but but there, was, there was another incident at, of a woman at a well. She was approaching Jesus and saying, please, please, Lord, uh, help my daughter. She's very sick. And mm. his disciples initially turned her away, and she persisted. Jesus said, no, I have, I have only come here for the lost children of Israel it is not right, this is, I think verbatim, it is not right 
to take the food from the children and feed it to the dogs. Right, but then she re replied, um, but even the dogs take the scraps from the master's table. Yeah. So and that's when you, he changed his so, mind. So you can have the extras, but the, the, the tribe gives the gets the, um, right. the important stuff, the good stuff. And then if we have any excess, then we can give it to others if, right. if we and have I, it. You know? Yeah, and it seems like Paul was the one that really made it a universalist religion. Um, if you really look at the New Testament, it was Paul, not Jesus, that made this universalized, that wanted to preach to the Gentiles and take it out of uh, Israel. And a lot of what we think of as Christian doctrine actually comes from Paul, not the Christ. Oh, absolutely. And th that was Nietzsche's big criticism of Christianity. It was not Jesus, yeah, but mine Paul. too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here. And I'm a big, uh, I'm a disciple of Nietzsche. Uh, one hundred percent. So I, I share in that prejudice. Yeah, N Nietzsche is an interesting one, and he's he's interesting because there doesn't seem to be a lot of apologetics dealing with his criticisms in uh, the genealogy of morals or the uh, the Antichrist. Um, it's not an unanswerable one, I don't think, but it's a it's a difficult one. I am of the opinion that um, he did a little bit of anthropomorphizing himself. I was speaking with a Catholic priest before writing in defense of hate, or before publishing, rather, in defense of hatred. And he was saying that uh, hatred is never justified, which I didn't agree with, obviously, but I, I let him speak and <laughs> explain himself. And he said that uh, whenever we hate someone, we are, um, it's because we're confronting our own weakness in opposition to the outside world. And we're projecting our anger at ourself onto other people. And I think there's – and he went on to say that we have, this, we have this view of God that comes from the weakness of our own human minds f primarily from our fathers, our biological fathers. So if our fathers let us down in some way, that can be the, the opening to a, um, a weakness in the – transcendent god the transcendent holy father as opposed to our mortal one and nietzsche sure. was the son of a lutheran father who died from a from a disease when he was very young now he loved his father very very much and mourned for him for years and he grows up to be the man who writes that god is dead and we have killed him not not god never was or something else relatively more clear no, God is dead. It, it seems like a little bit of personal projection on his part, just yeah. to sort of open things. Well, on the one hand, um, I'm very wary of when priests or, or any religious figure will rely upon you know, Freudian psychoanalysis, which is what it <laughs> seems like he's talking about. But on the other hand, I, he has a point, because uh, like the Christ said, you should remove the plank from your own eye before you would remove the speck of dust from your brothers. You should always look to yourself first. Um, and if there is a weakness in the world, or like Aleister Crowley said, if, uh, you know, who sees um, the, the world of magic is a mirror. And if you see the world as filth, then look at yourself because there is filth in the mirror. Um, the same thing is true of religion, you know, and I, that's why, you know, you wanted to talk tonight about um, is Christianity, does that make us weak? Or, you know, does Christianity or paganism, which makes us stronger? Um, I think if you're, you know, the sort of Christian who looks at everything as a persecution, like most Jews do, uh, I think that's an internal thing. I don't think that's necessarily part of the religion, and it's certainly not the world. Uh, you need to look in yourself, and that's really the point of religion itself, is so that you look at yourself, and you decide, and like we talked about on Gariya Radio, um, that quote by Muad'Dib in Dune, you know, religion is something that uh, makes us look at ourselves and say, I want to become this person, and I am not yet that person. And that is the real benefit of religion. Well, just from a symbolic perspective, there's something oddly similar between the, the little weak desert mouse that is yet clever and able to survive in all sorts of 
dangerous and difficult environments. And the the lamb that is slain symbolism in Christianity. Most of us are so used to seeing gods that are horses or eagles or lions. Um, the, the tiger goddess uh, of the Kali Fugi tiger, uh, faithful tiger cult. You know, th things like that. And it, the, this, the power that comes, I won't say from weakness, but from other sources than the violence, um, I think is at the mo it, it used to be overplayed. I think it's being a little underplayed or underappreciated by many people these days. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I've never made that connection between Muad'Dib and the Christ. Um, but you think of the Lamb, and specifically in the book of Revelation, you know, the wrath of the Lamb to come. And, you know, I think the Christian apologists would say that, you know, the first coming of Jesus was the lamb that is peaceful and the second coming is the wrath of the lamb um but that that's a that's an interesting one i'll put that in my pipe and smoke it later <laughs> well i'm i'm not extremely familiar with revelations I, i've read it a few times and each time i read it i'm become more certain that i don't know what it's saying but the most of the depictions of hell that i've heard revolve around separation from God, which mm -hmm. viewing the Christian God as essentially the God of other people, the, the, the God of community, more so than the God of thunder or of you know, these sorts of things. It derives, he derives his power from society, from other people. Jesus says, whenever two or more of you come together in my name, I will be there with you. If you take that literally, you begin to get an idea of the nature of who Jesus actually is, in my opinion, anyways. Um, well, I'm sorry, it cut out there for a second. Um, yeah. What I was going to say is, um, you know, I, I think that's more a modern, from what I understand of it, I mean, maybe I missed some reading there, but it seems like a modern uh, synthesis of something, because it looks like, you know, things were meant quite literally. Like when the Christ talks about hell, he uses Gehenna, which was a, a valley where they burned the trash outside of Jerusalem. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, necessarily Hades. I, the Jews did not have this concept of the afterlife that the pagans did. Um, but, I mean, it certainly could be now that, um, you know, people are offended by the thought of an eternal hell, uh, that they have now made it about community and the absence of God. But I think that's more a later theological invention than it was the original intention uh, of the people back then. Well, perhaps, but I've, I've come to view, and this is the result of reading perhaps too much Joseph Campbell and, and Carl Jung, uh, indirectly at least. Um, I imagine it in terms of economics for a second. No one person understands all the intricacies and details of how an economy works all we can do is come up with analogies that involve you know bananas and coconuts and um, production possibility frontiers to understand the sorts of relationships that exist between people and and patterns that can help us optimize our allocations of resources in with finite amount of resources and the whole Bible is full of – it contains history, but it also contains poetry, and it contains a genre of literature similar to Aesop's fables. You know, Who knows if the story of Job is actually true or not in a literal historical sense? But in some sense, it's more true than history in that the truth contained in it is not from a particular instance. But it, it, it delineates a sort of relationship that um, isn't dependent on historical events. Yeah, absolutely. Sense. Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. I mean, you read novels that have more truth than any nonfiction book. Right. Um, you read, like, you know, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. And that has some serious truths to it and some serious gravity. Uh, you know, no pun intended on the title. Um, but that has a lot more truth than, you know, some nonfiction book about Susan B. Anthony that you're going to find in Barnes & Noble. Um, there are a lot of truths in fiction 
and in poetry and in drama, you know, like reading Shakespeare, uh, you'll, you'll find a wealth of information and truth about the world and of human nature in Shakespeare that you won't find in any other nonfiction book, no matter how many biographies you read. So absolutely, uh, there is a great deal of truth. There's a treasure hoard of truth within the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, as a pagan, would not deny that. But the, 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 you know, you don't have to be a Christian to accept certain truths in the Bible. The, the, the real tricky question is, what is the sort of truth that the writers of the Bible were trying to convey? Did they think that hell was a literal place? Or did they mean it as a sort of a figurative place? Or, you know, was it a Santa Claus designed to modify behavior, but with no basis in reality? What are they talking about? And I, I've been working through the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn this last week. And I, I tend to side with Jordan Peterson in saying that hell is a very real um, place. And you can experience it right here on Earth if you... Um, as Solzhenitsyn says, perhaps we didn't love freedom enough in the beginning. If you don't value the right things, if you put certain things, whether it's being nice or, or being self-righteous or um, whatever sin might be, um, ahead of the value of other people, then you can find yourself in hell. And boy, does it feel like eternity when you end up in a, in a labor camp in the you know, Soviet wastelands. Well, conversely, I mean, the same thing is true when Jesus said that the kingdom of God is here. It's within you. Right. It's not some distant afterlife. The kingdom of God is present and eternal and all around you. You just have to wake up to it. Um, so, you know, hell and heaven are both on earth. Milton said the same thing. Um, but this also this concept of uh, putting, you know, really trivial things, uh, putting worldly things, as Christians might say, or unworthy things, as pagans might say, uh, that's really a concept that both Christianity and paganism share, because there are things that you should involve in your life, and there are things that you should not. Uh, and perhaps those things differ, you know, like Christianity does not put an emphasis on um, the strength of the body. Perhaps the purity of the body as the temple of God, but not the strength of the body, which is something emphasized in paganism. Mm -hmm. um, but you still, I, whichever way you cut it, Christianity or paganism, there are certain things that you want to um, pursue in life and certain things that you need to eschew. Uh, and that's kind of the point of religion is to give you that path and tell you this is the right action and this is the wrong action. And that's very much the virtue of religion. Part of, part of me wonders if the reason that physical strength isn't emphasized as much in the Bible uh, comes from the fact that in, in those times, virtually everyone was walking everywhere and were carpenters and laborers of some kind. Um, and already strong. I, I don't think so, because it seems to me that Christianity is very ascetic. And you see that um, reading Nietzsche, that's one of his greatest criticisms of Christianity is that it was so ascetic a religion. And that's also prevalent in many Eastern religions because the denial of the body to Eastern religions and Christianity and Gnosticism, the denial of the body is the fruition of the spirit because the body and the spirit are uh, their antitheses of each other. They are in opposition, they're inimical. So if you deny the body, then the spirit can grow. And if you relish in the body, then your spirit degrades and degenerates. And that's a very Christian concept that paganism does not share. I, I think I might read this a little bit differently. The intention in, in many of these, um, these sermons that Jesus gives a little bit differently. All the, the way that he speaks in parables and in stories always seems to to be intended to to change the mindset of the listener no one when they they hear his story of the um the men investing their talents variously or the uh the the farmers who get hired over the course of the day and they all receive the same salary at the end none of these i don't think is intended 
literally as truth because there are so many I don't, I don't even know how to phrase it. it. It seems more gauged to get people's priorities and mindsets correct. If, if the Christians didn't believe that the body mattered at all, then phrases like your body is a temple, um, I don't think would, would carry the weight that it, that it has. And that's the justification that many people use not to use um, drugs, although the context of that particular one is explicitly sexual. But in that context, I think that um, they have Christianity is more about rejecting an, an undue and excessive interest in the body, a vanity of the body that I think itself has been taken a little bit to excess to, to the point of neglect. In these days, I don't think Christianity is responsible for that. I think a kind of egalitarianism that has crept into society and justified a lot of other excesses is primarily responsible for that. But, I mean, the, the Christian rejection of the body as as being of less value than, than sp other spiritual matters, though by no means of no value at all, is actually rather close to the Stoic attitude that you might find in Zeno or Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius. Sure, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to put the body beneath the spirit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm very much a mystic myself. I always say I'm a mystic primarily, I'm religious primarily, and if I'm political, it's only secondary or tertiary. So I understand, you know, putting the spirit first. I talk all the time about the world of the spirit and its, its conflict with what I call the gray world of man. Um, so I wouldn't knock Christianity for, you know, trying to put the body in its place. And actually, mm -hmm. Aleister Crowley uh, did the same thing where he wrote a book um, giving instructions to all students. And it was how to make sure that your mind is the master, your will is the master of your body, of your actions, your speech, and your thoughts. And you do that by uh, basically uh, harming your body. Anytime it acts out of line with your will, if your actions, your speech, and your thoughts are not in accordance with your will, you mark yourself with a razor, and that hurts like hell. So that teaches your body to fear your will. Um, so that's not necessarily a Christian concept um, to Boy, make the body subordinate to the will. It's not a favorable current Christian practice, but Christians weren't averse to things like self-flagellation in the past. It's right. just fallen out of um, modern style, shall we say. I, I think Yeah, that's not like... necessarily a denial of the body, but it mm -hmm. is a way to make sure that the body is in submission to your will. And I think that crosses the border between paganism and Christianity because pagans too would say all things should be in submission to the will, whether it's your thoughts, your deeds, uh, or your words. Mm -hmm. I think where, where Christians um, aren't even in disagreement, but maybe take it one step further is not my will, but the will of God is the one that's in charge. And uh, the, the goal being that if you live in accordance with the will of God rather than with your own will, then you actually have a framework for action. Because if, if it's only your own will in charge, there's actually not a whole lot of justifications to do really anything in particular. Um, you have to you have to create them yourself, and there's not a lot of there's not a lot of substance and grounding behind that. So when you have the will of God, the will of the um, transcendent goodness and perfection, and other people motivating you, that you have an obligation to serve God's will. It opens you up to more power. And right. Well, that's something I should probably explain about paganism, because people think of paganism and they think orgies and, you know, symposiums and drug abuse and satanic sacrifice. And in actuality, um, pagans believe the same concept. I think all religion 
really is submission of the individual will to the divine will. And that's actually really emphasized in Thelema. So if you look at other uh, religions, you know, uh, whether it's Odinism or ancient uh, Roman paganism, um, you have to submit yourself to the divine will. That's a, that's a given. But in Thelema specifically, it's very pronounced because the entire great work, as we call it, is to unify your individual will with the divine will, to submit yourself to the divine will in the same way that Christians do or Muslims do. Um, so that's something that's not really pronounced because everybody's so focused on the trappings. Everybody's focused on the sex and drugs. And I was too, you know, when I was a teenager and w throughout my 20s. Um, but really, when you get to the essence of the religion, I think that's a truth that it crosses bounds of all religions, that you must submit the individual will to the divine will if you are to accomplish what you were put on this earth to do. Well, I mean, Crowley was towards the end of his life as well, was he not? I'm sorry, Crowley was what? Crowley was caught up in that too at the end of his life as well, was he Oh, not? you mean sex and drugs? Yeah, sure, certainly. Um, I mean, he was a heroin addict. That's He was a notorious drug addict mm -hmm. and a fiend. Um, and his polyamory is well documented. Um, however, people don't seem to understand that it wasn't just plain hedonism. Crowley was an adventurer. He was uh, a scientist. He was trying to um, experience all of these things so that he could bring about spiritual truths. He wasn't just, you know, fucking everything that walked just for the fun of it. He was doing it as part of his religious explorations. I mean, when you're creating a religion and you're being scientific about it, and you're trying to be transgressive in order to break social boundaries and get to the real truth of the thing, that's what he was doing. Uh, there was a Christian sect that was banned for obvious reasons uh, back in the day where they did that same thing, and they said you have to experience all things in order to understand, and you have to be able to get past your own revulsions uh, because those things are prejudices of the body and prejudices of the mind. You have to break all these boundaries, and then you can understand the truth of God. And Crowley really took up that same methodology. So, you know, he's misunderstood, uh, just as I've been misunderstood, uh, as someone who just, you know, is kind of a free love hippie, and that's not at all what he was about. Sure. I, I guess it comes down to um, motivations. I, I think the actual best framing of of this question what what are the things that you ought to be pursuing comes from the iliad where you have achilles who is basically offered two options he could go to war and he would be remembered for all of time but he would die young right or he could stay at home he could not go to war he could raise a family and die in old age, surrounded by his children and his grandchildren who loved him. But his great-great-grandchildren would not remember his name. And it's a tough question. And emotionally, the desire is like, well, they, they both sound um, attractive, but the, the, the fame and glory of being remembered forever is a hard thing to turn down. You're essentially the most memorable hero of all time. Well, where does that desire come from, though? Where does the desire to be remembered by everybody come from? I would posit, if you dig into evolutionary psychology, that that comes from wanting to attract a mate. And if you're actually um, giving up the opportunity to have a family, which is how you achieve real immortality, right? Is by literally passing on a piece of yourself into the future um, for a chance to be remembered. That seems pathological from a biological standpoint. And so getting the motivations right from the start, because mistakes that you make in your uh, t 30s or 20s or even teens can, can be lifelong uh, course-altering mistakes or advantages. And, and so I think what Christianity has 
over things like um, Thelema or, or other pagan traditions that, that aren't quite as explicit in their rules is they, they, they pay the price of being a little bit more authoritarian. Uh, a, a friend's dad was chatting with me the other day. It's like people, people experience Christianity as this very confining um, faith that with all these rules and it's, it's very authoritarian. And they reject it for many of the reasons that um, Christopher Hitchens, for example, rejects it. It's a it's a, a celestial North Korea that you have to follow all these rules. But the the motivations behind following the rules, I th I think, is the the more holistically fulfilling pursuit in the fulfillment of time. Well, see, I would disagree with you there because i see there's a, another one of the big differences between christianity and paganism is that christianity's ethics are based off of um this is holy scripture these are the words of god this is what god has commanded and this is what we should follow because god is the sumum bonum and if he is the greatest good then this is what we should follow and paganism is a little different in that it is based on virtue ethics so whether you're a heathen following the Germanic tradition or, um, you know, an ancient Roman, uh, the story is the same. You're basing everything on virtues. And whether those virtues come from your family or from the tribe or just from society at large, what you're emphasizing is not a specific verse or a specific dictum or a specific law um, or anything of the sort. What you're emphasizing is your, the values that you hold. Um, you are acting in line with courage or truth or honor. Um, you are acting in line with those virtues and different situations arise, but you always keep in mind that these are our virtues and this is what we act on. And I would say the same is true of Achilles because he lived in that era. He clearly obviously was a pagan. Um, his mother was a goddess, by the way. So he was acting in accordance with those virtues. And back then, to seek eternal glory, uh, with, you know, whether you're watching 300 or reading the Iliad, to seek eternal glory was a good in itself. So certainly, you're, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, you're not having children. But you know, anybody can have a kid. Uh, not all men can be remembered for the next 3,000 years because you are the greatest warrior ever to walk the face of the earth. So that's the sort of value that they place emphasis on uh, rather than saying, you know, his mother uh, giving him the dictum because this is what Zeus said. And that's, I think, a big difference between the two religions. I'm actually not sure glory does have a an intrinsic justification. Now, where I think glory becomes valuable is I, I went to, to boot camp in the Navy with a guy whose last name was Leondis. And I told him, man, your name is like one juxtaposition letter switch off from being the coolest last name ever. <laughs> he said, well, actually, my grandparents emigrated here from Greece. And when they passed through Ellis Island, they couldn't pronounce it or spell it right. And they swapped it around. His real last name was Leonidas. And not only that, he was a male bloodline descendant from the Spartan king all the way back. And I was just like, dude. You got to get that changed back right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> male bloodline descendant of the Leonidas. Uh, and, and he has that in his past forever now. And his kids will too. And, and that's an extraordinary gift of his ancestors to him that he can maintain as long as he has kids, of course. Um, in the same way that I am descendant on my father's mother's side from um, William the Conqueror and by extension Rollo but um, that's that's some justification for um, the, the value oh, you of cut glory. out there can you hear me oh yes uh, that's some justification for the yes. the the value of of glory but I, I'm not going to disagree with your virtue ethics absolutely right but I think if you see it's Cutting out again on me. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. What I was going to say, if you look at Leonidas, though, uh, specifically, because that's the example here, I think he made the same decision that 
Achilles made. Because, yes, he had a son, he had a family, but he wasn't given the choice that Achilles' mother gave, which was you can choose either eternal glory or a family. Um, but even so, Leonidas chose the same as Achilles because he did die uh, before old age. Um, what they valued was not comfort and old age and to be around the fire with the family. What they valued was war and glory and triumph. Um, so that uh, is Greek in its essence. That is the classical culture in its essence. Whereas today, you know, modern family life is what we value. You go out in the suburbs, you know, watch TV with the family, have family dinner, don't do anything too dangerous. Uh, and that is the sort of life that the, our ancient pagan ancestors would be rolling over in their graves if they could see us today. Well, I mean, Christianity has this as well. I mean, no, no greater love hath a man than to lay down his life for another comes from Jesus. And that's exactly what Leonidas did, except not just for another man, but for an entire nation and a fellow uh, city-state as well. True. Well, that's also a good place to end on because it is Holy Saturday and I'm actually sitting outside the cathedral for Holy Saturday mass. And as we know, the Christ laid down his life for the entire world, not just his <laughs> city state, not just his family, um, but for all humanity. So, mm -hmm. you know, Christian or pagan, you should be able to appreciate that even if you don't accept it. <laughs> Certainly. Well, the Lord be with you. <laughs> and also with you, brother. <laughs> good chatting. Yeah, thanks for having me, man.